Thanks, Dr. Borsma, and thank you, Dr. Mr. R uh, Dr. and Mrs. Rigsby, my dear friends. Uh, would you please turn in your Bibles to Psalm 3 or shut down your browsers and navigate there? And while you are, I'm going to tell you a story. It's a personal story, and I apologize for that, but they're the only kind I've had. Uh, when I was in pilot training in the Air Force, every different aircraft had a set of emergency procedures that we had to learn, and many parts of them we had to memorize so we could respond instantaneously should an emergency arise without having to refer to the checklist strapped to our leg. Now, the only emergency I ever had was flying a little twin jet trainer called a T-37. And one of the emergency procedures for the T-37 was emergency bailout on takeoff. That's yeah, as bad as it sounds. <laughs> and the first line in that emergency procedure was check altitude and airspeed. The T-37 did not have a zero-zero ejection seat. That meant we couldn't eject standing still on the ground. We had to have at least 100 feet of altitude and 120 knots of airspeed. One day I was doing practice touch and go landings on an auxiliary airfield flying solo and just after landing I accelerated, became airborne, hit the gear lever to retract the gear and the airplane yawed and pitched downward and there was a loud thunk over on the left side of the airplane. And the first thing I knew was that I didn't have 100 feet 120 knots. I couldn't bail out. I don't know if I would have, but I knew that I couldn't. Having practiced that emergency procedure so often in a simulator, having recited it every time an instructor pilot asked, that emergency procedure automatically triggered. Now, I'll finish the story so you know that I didn't die. Uh, uh, my left main landing gear had not retracted, and I rendezvoused with another aircraft that flew solo, or flew formation with me and checked the landing gear, and it would not rise, and it would not indicate it was locked down, so I flew back to the main field and made a very cautious, straight-in approach, and I noticed fire engines parked alongside <laughs> the, the runway as I came in, and uh, we weren't sure if that landing gear was locked or not, and I made probably the best landing of my life. Later, my instructor pilot said if he had known, he would have brought marshmallows just in case. <clears throat> the point is, having drilled that emergency procedure into my head, I responded automatically. I just knew, without even thinking about it, check altitude and airspeed. Now in our life, we all will face emergencies. Crisis will come. That's part and parcel of being human. It may threaten your finances or your health. It may be a crisis in ministry or family. But crisis will come. And what matters is how we respond to it. Do we have the emergency procedures to respond properly? Oh, I can hear some of you thinking right now, not us. <laughs> that's, that's not going to happen to me. Uh, I'm going to Christian University. I'm in seminary. I'm training for the ministry. Uh, I serve an omnipotent God. He's going to protect me. But uh, we know that that's not correct. We remember Job, the most righteous man on the face of the earth, who lost everything. Elijah, following the Lord's leading to Zarephath, and there where he'd seen the miracle of the oil and the meal replenished, saw the widow's son die. Or think of Hebrews chapter 11, that great roll call of heroes of the faith. The first person there is, is Abel. He had faith and he died. The second person is Enoch. He had faith and he didn't die. The third person is Noah. He had faith and everybody else died. Uh, do, you see, do you see the pattern there? <laughs> Just because we're right in the middle of God's will doesn't mean crisis won't come. In Psalm 3, we see how David responded to a crisis. And from this, we can draw out emergency procedures, things that we need to learn now to prepare us for that day ahead. So come with me, if you will. We'll travel halfway around the world and 
turn the clock back some three millennia, and we're down in the dark of the Jordan Valley behind us. We can hear the Jordan as it murmurs its way to the Dead Sea. Back there in the west, the hills of Judea are just a black, opaque mass. They've already swallowed the constellation Orion, and across the valley, above the hills of Moab, the morning star has already risen. Over there in that cleft between the big boulders, a number of bodies are asleep. (laughs) I hope not. (laughs) (laughs) And here, not far from where we watch, a lone figure pulls his cloak more tightly about him. He stands up, gazes at the stars, and begins humming in a minor key. We recognize his profile. This is King David. David, that great theocratic leader, the head of one of the most important empires of his era. David, the man who was a spiritual leader of his people. David, a man whom you and I have admired and desired to be like a man sold out for God, a man after God's own heart. And here he is, shivering in the desert night, far from the throne in Jerusalem, far from the tabernacle with the Ark of the Covenant. We know he's not out here in some Boy Scout outing. David begins singing, his rich baritone voice putting words to the melody that he'd been humming. O Lord, how many are my foes, many are rising against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. The situation is clear now. Absalom has rebelled. Absalom, the toddler whose father was too busy organizing tabernacle worship to fix that broken toy. Absalom, the lad who wanted to spend time with his father, but affairs of state or some military campaign always got in the way. Absalom, the young man who realized to his surprise that he despised his father when he saw his father repent when his affair with Bathsheba had been exposed rather than stand firm in his might as sovereign. Absalom, the young man who had left home after a family feud, well, that's putting it mildly, he'd killed his brother and was not reconciled with his father. Absalom was seeking his father's life. David knows family crisis. But it's more than that. For David was a theocratic leader and he's been forced to abandon the throne. David had organized the worship and led much of it before the tabernacle and he could no longer be the leader spiritually of the theocratic people. David understands civil and religious conflict as well. His baritone voice continues singing. But you, O Lord, are shield about me. You're the glory. You're the lifter of my head. I cry aloud to the Lord, and he answered me from his holy hill. We remember the events of the past 24 hours. Absalom had assembled a group of malcontents at Hebron, people whom he had bribed or coerced or or somehow got to abandon their loyalty to David, had declared himself king and was marching on Jerusalem. In the chaos of that morning, David had made a series of rapid decisions. He decided not to stand in Jerusalem and fight, but rather to flee. He sent Zadok the priest back to the tabernacle with the Ark of the Covenant rather than allowing it to accompany him down to the Jordan. He ignored Shimei throwing rocks and insults at him as he left the city. He told his faithful counselor Hushai to return, feign allegiance to Absalom in order to thwart the counsel of Ahithophel. 
surrounded by frantic men, crying women, screaming children, barking dogs, donkeys braying in weird ways. David had made decisions. They weren't frantic, but he wasn't paralyzed by inaction either. David says, I cried aloud to the Lord and he answered me from his holy hill. David could see, having prayed yesterday morning, that God was already beginning to answer him in the decisions he was making. David knew that although the crisis was far from resolved, he had taken the first step in crisis response. He had referred it to his omnipotent Lord. David began by praying. David knew, as Oliver Wilson would say centuries later, prayer fills a man's weakness with God's omnipotence. It opens the gates to new fields of achievement. It makes the weak strong and the simple wise. By first praying to God, by referring the crisis to God, David took the first step of his emergency procedures. The voice begins singing again. I lay down and slept. I woke again, for the Lord sustained me. I will not be afraid of many thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. We wondered about that. How had David been able to sleep in the midst of a crisis where his own son is trying to kill him? When his anointed place on the throne is in jeopardy, David lay down and slept. And we realize that having referred the crisis to God, David now was able to rest in God's ability to handle it. Refer, rest. The first two steps in the emergency procedures. I wonder about myself. When I face a crisis, some emergency is coming at me, and I pray about it, pray with my wife, we talk it through. I refer it to the Lord, and then I lay awake, thinking of eight or 16 or 27 different solutions, just to be sure God hasn't missed one of the options available to him. Can I rest in the sovereign God's ability to handle this crisis? If not, why should I refer it to him in the first place? But if I have referred it to him, now I can rest. I should be able, as David was, to sleep because God sustains me. The baritone voice now moves to a major key and he sings a bit louder. Arise, O Lord. Save me, O my God. For you strike all my enemies on the cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing be upon the people. Having referred the crisis to God and rested in God's ability to handle it, now David refocuses. He knows that up there in Jerusalem, there's a crowd of people that are confused. Many are afraid. Many are doubting. Is David gone for good? Should I pledge allegiance to Absalom? Who really is in charge here? The confusion of David's people is what's on his heart at the end of this psalm. And David turns his attention from himself to them to the ones to whom he has a ministry. Uh, Self-pity is delightful, but it's a destructive narcotic. David refocused and didn't indulge in self-pity. He had a confidence born in the faith, a faith that knew his God, 
a faith that knew his sovereign. And so he could refocus. How about us? When we face trials, suffering, crisis, do we think first and last about ourselves? People around us are affected as well. What about them? Is this calling into question their faith in God as they watch me? Do they wonder, if that can happen to my professor, maybe God's really not in control. If my pastor can have that happen in his family, why should I keep trusting? We may not be aware of the fact that our crisis spreads. It has ripples. But as we refer the crisis to God and rest in his ability, we should refocus on those who may be affected by it. How can we minister to them even in the midst of the crisis? Dawn is beginning to lighten the sky there above the hills of Moab. And there's stirrings over there among the sleeping camp as they begin to wake up and stretch from a night on the hard rocks. David knows that the crisis isn't past. Today will bring more heartache. It will bring more hard decisions. The challenge isn't over, but David is convinced that God is in control. He's referred the crisis to him. God can handle it. He can rest in that. God lifts his head. God will bring down his enemies. God will sustain those whom David prays for as he refocuses. Whatever is ahead, we know as we watch David that he will handle this day well. He's mastered his emergency procedures. And so, what about us? What happens if your father calls and tells you your younger brother was busted for drugs? What happens in the middle of the economic slump when your boss calls you in and tells you she's very sorry, but, and your source of income disappears? Or if you're a youth pastor and the senior pastor wants a meeting with you and he begins by saying, I had a meeting last night with many of the parents of the youth in your group and you realized that the sheep of your little flock have turned carnivorous. Or your wife comes home from a routine doctor's appointment with fear in her eyes. The question isn't if crisis will come, it's what do we do when it comes. Now's the time to learn the emergency procedures and have confidence in them. David shows us, refer, rest, refocus. The three R's of crisis response. Check altitude and airspeed. <laughs> Don't bail out yet. Refer. Rest, refocus. Don't give in to despair. We hope you enjoyed this message. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Learn more at biola.edu.